So, welcome again to the Warfighter Simulation Training Podcast, Episode 4, Season 2. Hello, Tom. Love it. Well, I love it. You always keep me guessing. You know, I've got I've got a set pattern at the start of an episode. Colin, you just make it up. You are flying by the seat of your pants every single time. It's wonderful. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, Colin, before we go into the chat, I think there's something we need to share. And this, I know you'll appreciate this. I've had my first experience of a digger back on the on the farm mate and yes. i've got to say i know that people get excited when you say you've got a digger coming over and i've had people like offering can i come and do digger things i couldn't get it but oh my goodness me diggers are amazing what good fun and you just feel like a god as you're digging into the ground it's awesome <laughs> yeah but you were using it to sort of scarify were you or you actually doing a trench bit of both right we got it for the trench but then again it's all about scarification and and defielding the fields and putting it back to nature was the kind of secondary benefits of that. But I, I can really get behind the people getting excited about diggers now. Again, we're not paid to say this, but there is a place called Diggerland, and that's exactly all it's for. It's for you know, it's people who've not quite grown up yet, including me, <laughs> to go and have a go on diggers. Is that so like a season three sponsor, you're thinking? <laughs> yeah, I think it's called Diggerland. I think there's, there's a couple now in the country. Amazing. Yeah. So we're very fortunate to have some very kind sponsors. A bit more about that later. And they let us go and do what we like, really, what we enjoy. Like, this one's no exception. We, we've gone to talk to the RAF about what they've been up to for probably the last six or seven years in simulation, really, to see what we can understand from what they've done. Yeah, and I didn't have a lot a big... Well, I haven't had anything to do, really, from an RAF simulation perspective. But Gladiator as a project, which is what we're going to talk about, is actually really forward-leaning. And, and it's great to see... An organization picking up simulation going look we're not doing this well enough let's let's really professionalize the, the approach and go forward with it and i think maybe even people looking obviously we've got cttp collective training transformation program coming out or acts as it's called now and maybe you know this essentially people who are interested in cttp may have value learning from an approach that the ref have taken in terms of their distributed training and it's really interesting you know, maybe even i don't know our sponsors Babcock may benefit, even benefit from listening to this as well. So you're welcome, Babcock and Team Crucible going forwards. <laughs> yes, you know, we couldn't do it without the support. So thanks again. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest this week, which is Rory Henderson Begg. So we're very pleased to introduce someone that we've been dying to get on the podcast. I'm sorry it's been season two, but, you know, <laughs> it, schedules and everything else. But the stars have aligned, Tom, so that's great news. Very pleased to introduce Rory Henderson Begg, which many of our listeners may already know about. Previously, SO1 Synthetics within the Air Force and Gladiator Program Manager. So we'll get into what that is, but that's a pretty key program for the RAF. And there's another scoop, Tom, now moving to be Chief Modelling and Simulation Officer for the RAF ah. in this new post. So congratulations all round. Thanks. Look, I've done a little intro, but it's probably best if we hear from you. Can you just paint a bit more, a bit of colour into that, what you've been doing probably for the last oh, know, six, eight years, is it? Yeah, of course, Colin, uh, Tom, and you know, first off, really glad to be here. This is a first for me in terms of a podcast, so I'm I'm quite excited about it. But in the who am I, where do I come from? By education, I'm an aerospace engineer, but that was a long time ago. I wasn't very good at it, and I probably ought not to use that in anger at any stage. <laughs> um, by training, I'm a Royal Air Force navigator on Tornado GR1s, GR4s with just under 2,000 hours and 12 years or so in the cockpit. A lot of that on the Tornado OCU, so teaching junior pilots and navigators to operate the jet. And then for the last five and a half years, I have been in capability delivery as a program and project leader, largely for the Gladiator program, but also for Sabre, and then getting involved with other bits of modelling and simulation ar around the Air Force, supporting the Service Command Technical Authority and supporting STRATCOM as we start to develop modelling and simulation for defence. That's recently. I've been in the Air Force, I think, most of my life. I was an air cadet sort of from 13 onwards sponsored through university so i guess if you cut me I, i'm pretty much light blue but more i'm pretty much a serviceman and that's really my my interest i've been quite surprised to be so enthused with modeling and simulation it's not something I'd, I'd ever really come to in the past i was never really a gamer and i had to be talked into this last job by my group captain at the time who i'd worked with previously but i've i've really really enjoyed it and i've really found it a way to channel my energies and to do something actually deliver something for the Air Force. And that's really why I stayed with Gladiator, because I saw the opportunity to deliver and to finish something that I thought was really worthwhile and to make a difference. 
So that's me, I think, for the moment. And I think we'll come back to that topic. So I'm just noting down a number of things we are going to come back to and uh, dig, yeah, pull the threads a bit more. You know, I'm familiar with Gladiator, seeing, you know, we've sort of bumped into each other around the various meetings and bazaars. But for those that, that don't know what that is and its heritage, can you just give a quick overview of what you've been building for the, the past four years? Of course, Colin. Clearly, I'm air crew, so my favourite subject is myself. So I'll talk about me first <laughs> and my experiences with simulation. So my first sim was a cardboard cockpit of a bulldog that I used to sit in front of on my bed at university to learn my checks. That's a simulator, you know, basic as it is. And then through training, I had a number of simulators. Uh, and then when I got onto the Tornado GR1 at the time, we had a full motion simulator. It had no visuals and it was really good for learning emergencies, learning procedures, terrain following radar, weapons attacks and things like that. By the time I left the Tornado, we had a pair of link sims with visuals. You could do close air support training, very much focused on Herrick. But the common thing through all of that is whenever I spoke to somebody outside the cockpit, somebody apart from my pilot or the crew of the other aircraft, I wasn't speaking to a forward air controller. I wasn't speaking to a battle space manager or a typhoon pilot or anybody else. I was speaking to a sim tech on the console downstairs who was either reading a script or doing their best to ad lib in a role they'd never been current or competent in. So you can query how good that training is. That brings me on to the reason for Gladiator. Gladiator is distributed synthetic training. We link individual platform capability simulators to a centrally hosted synthetic environment so that they can train together, do operational training together. It's supported by a white force of about 40 people at the moment. Half of those are service personnel, half of those are contracted, but they are all qualified and competent in various air, space and, and land roles. So if I was still in a Tornado GR4 sim linked to Gladiator, if I'm talking to a Typhoon cockpit, I'm either talking to a Typhoon pilot or I'm talking to a qualified White Force role player. If I'm talking to a JTAC in the future, I'll either be talking to somebody in the JTAC training facility at, at Lark Hill or, or one of the other land bases, or I'll be talking to a trained JTAC White Force operator. So you get a, a step change in the utility and I, and I think the effectiveness of that training. And the aim of Gladiator is to link platforms and capabilities from all of the four war fighting domains in time into that single synthetic environment so we can provide multi-domain operational training, multi-domain integration and augment and complement training that is done in the live environment or in individual simulators in standalone mode. I think it's probably just important if people haven't spotted it yet this is not actually about cost reduction is it gladiators about doing things that actually are very difficult or Im impossible in the live environment yeah absolutely the raison d'etre for gladiator was because when we did some research back in the the mid 2000s and leading up to the sdsar in 2010 we realized we we had about a 40 percent shortfall within air in in the operational training objectives we were completing so it's not about replacing live flying, it's about augmenting those live training opportunities. Now, it will likely, and we're seeing a pivot towards synthetics and use of modelling and simulation across the air environment, it may mean that that live synthetic balance for individual forces changes, but that's taking advantage of whatever is there rather than Gladiator being designed specifically to replace that live training it's an enabler for that switch rather than a driver for that switch. I'm just really excited to hear this because Gladiator, in terms of the depth we're going to go into, is new to me. I think off-air we discussed things like, it's really exciting to hear that you're moving kind of from regular service to the reserve role. I mean, I imagine it's full-time, but the that where you're going to bring your expertise to be the point of contact for synthetics across the RAF. And it, it, we said it's not rocket science, but it's great that it, the RAF have decided to make this change. And similar to what you've just described, connecting SMEs using a distributed network to train isn't rocket science conceptually, but I'm sure it is 
way more complicated than it has sounded. I mean, how many years in development was this? So when did it hit its initial operating capability? So we hit IOC in January this year through delivery of the, of the core systems and services in the infrastructure with a, with a white force and ready to start connecting capabilities. But the journey, as you say, Tom, has been quite a long one. You know, we started off again back in the 2000s with a concept called mission training through distributed simulation. And back at that stage, the Air Force was going to buy and build targeted fidelity simulators for all the Air Force force elements that they would do collective training in. So Gladiator is aimed at that higher level team and collective training and and up parts of, of the operational training spectrum. That was prohibitively expensive. And so there was a bit of a rethink, but it wasn't just air doing this. The whole of defense was looking at the need to make better use of simulation. So Gladiator is is really the working name for defense operational training capability brackets air, dot C alpha. And dot C alpha is just one of four programs, dot C maritime, land and joint along with alpha that represented each individual services drive or attempt to move more into the simulated or synthetic training regime. And Gladiator just happens to be the most mature of those capabilities. You know, within the land environment, you've got CTTP, the Collective Training Transformation Program. You've got the Joint Fast Synthetic Trainer. Within the Royal Navy, you've got Spartan, which is is a name for DOTSI Maritime. And then you've got DOTSI Joint and programs like the Defence Synthetic Enablers Program within STRATCOM that, that are doing very much the same thing. So it's been close to 20 years in delivery. We let the contract back in 2019, and that was initially for a two-year delivery period and then a five years in service period. Clearly, COVID had a little bit of a part to play in that. And the fact that, as you alluded to just a couple of minutes ago, Tom, this was actually more complex and difficult than I think we understood. One of my personal theories... I don't know who shares it, but I do love a it, Colin personal theory. You know, uh, having been involved in lots of that early pre work in sort of night works and things, is actually a concept demonstrator built over a month or two is relatively easy to do and looks great. And people can definitely see the potential. But as you start to bring those things together, so individually, like comms or image generators or whatever you're using as COTS. It's like, okay, I've got all the bit, all the parts, but pulling them all together is kind of like you have like an exponential growth in complexity and problems. Maybe you want to talk to that. Yeah, absolutely. And there are lots, Colin, you've given me lots of threads to tug on there. So I'll just listen to start with and then then we'll come back to them. I guess the first is that agile approach that you discussed with the concept demonstrator versus the waterfall approach that the MOD is very used to delivering capabilities in. Then there's the use of COTS components and software, which was not a first for the MOD, but certainly a policy shift in terms of defense policy. And then you've got the MOD's ability to be an intelligent customer and to actually partner with the delivery company to deliver the capability. And all of those were factors and all of those have been huge learning experiences for us. So we can take those in any order you wish to draw on. Probably mo- many more than we can cover in this in this podcast. But your last point about intelligent customer, well, hell, let's let's just talk about that. But actually, what <laughs> we mean is intelligent people that are part of your team, not yeah. just industry people that are very clever. It's all of that. So what the MOD is not always very good at is understanding what we need and being able to articulate that in a way that our industry partners can understand. And we've certainly found that a lot with Gladiator. And Gladiator was delivered by by Bone Defence UK, but using a suite of commercially available off-the-shelf software components and getting ourselves to a stage where we could talk intelligently and effectively with Bone Defence UK, with Mac, with Antisip, with Pitch, with all of our various partners was really difficult. Uh, And there are some structural problems within the Air Force and I think within the forces that get in the way of us being an intelligent customer. One is that the people who should be driving this sort of thing, the people who understand it, are not people like me. They're not 25-year-plus wing commanders who've done lots of other jobs. They're your four or five years in SACs, corporals, who are gamers, who are coders, who understand how modeling and simulation work. 
And within the military, we don't have a career structure that rewards that type of specialization. It's brilliant that we've got a chief of the air staff who's an engineer now. I think that's a, a, a real sea change and starts to show that understanding that you don't just have to be a pilot or, or a navigator to be in, in command. But there aren't the career options for people who specialize in modeling in simulation. And then if I look at the other side of the, sort of the MODT, within the civil service, we simply don't pay people enough to keep them when they become good. So, you know, a, a software company, yeah. a big OEM like BAE Systems or Boeing can afford to pay decent people a lot more than we can. So I'm not convinced that the MOD will ever be able to generate the kind of organic knowledge, skills and experience it needs to be able to be that intelligent customer in its, in its own right. We're doing a lot of really good stuff. You know, we've got the service command technical authorities, uh, you know, they're, they're at various levels of maturity in the different services. We've got the courses that are done at the Defence Academy. But if, if you look at the take up for things like the Masters in um, Modeling and Simulation and the difficulty in getting people onto that course, it just speaks to how hard it's going to be for us to gain that intelligent customer status. With Glad8, we certainly realised that, that we just didn't have that. And we had to buy that in from industry, at least in the short to medium term, while we start to try and build up that experience and, and expertise within our own ranks. And clearly that's your option. You have to sort of bring in the, what's the word, the ringers, the, um, but the, you know, the, uh, the um, professionals on your team, that on your amateur team, as it were. And sorry, I didn't mean intelligent as in the RAF is stupid. I meant that, I think, in terms of that area of knowledge. So the interesting thing is, if we put our minds to it, the MOD and the military can do complex stuff. So <laughs> in my branch, they have a nuclear engineering course. That is pretty advanced. I know you don't have nuclear aircraft yet, Rory, but so the military can do it if they want to. And as you rightly say, we need to realise this is important. The military should get a grip of this from a, a knowledge and, and skills perspective. Absolutely. And I think you're exactly right. I think that modelling and simulation it and its importance is maybe advancing so quickly that we're finding it hard to keep up. And I know the military is trying to make those changes and hopefully we'll, we'll get to a stage where we do have that cadre of people who can do that sort of thing, but we're just not there at the moment. My reflections on those points there is that defence will try and catch up. It'd be nice to think that defence maybe will look to leapfrog because technology is going to continue to improve exponentially so i think someone needs to think not just trying to catch up but actually how do we get ahead of the game to make sure that we're set up for the future and that's only going to be beneficial what struck me about this conversation so far is consistency that the value of of you seeing a contract through to the end and you know I'm, I'm no expert but my experience of procurement is that often someone starts the delivery and then there's someone in the middle that kind of tries to unpick what's going on and then someone at the end who says well it wasn't really my fault but i've saved the day and that that is a really bad way to make sure there's pride and uh, and responsibility it, ultimately if you had the confidence to say i'm going to stick at this till we deliver it that is a lot of pressure on your shoulders to make sure that it, it works kudos for you for sticking at it till the end what i also liked like that career options i wanted to ask or make one point and then ask a question so you mentioned that defence may never be able to offer the salaries that industry will do. And that you're probably right on that. I think it needs to make sure there's balance in that. And so, you know, do, do I think that technical roles should make sure, especially within modelling and simulation, it's maybe been ne neglected. Yeah, I think there's an argument to make sure there's an X factor there. But defence has to make sure that it del delivers something different. And we know that there's a purpose behind the delivery and it's being part of a team, which, which again, it's harder for bigger organisations to deliver. But my question to you, and this may be unfair and put you on the spot slightly, but you mentioned career options for the RAF. Now, I know a lot of senior NCOs and NCOs generally and SACs that are hugely passionate and I've worked with them and it's an absolute pleasure to be with them. The amount of creativity and passion they have for what they're doing and the value that they want to bring to RAF is kind of clear. So is that something maybe that you that you see as an option going forward in your new role and, and kind of starting to champion M&S? Tom, absolutely. I mean, as you're aware, we've already got the Astra program within the Air Force, and that's mm -hmm. coming up with a, a lot of really, really impressive grassroots capabilities, purely coming out of people in a role with modeling and simulation ability going, I could make my job better by doing this, or I can use my, my modeling and sim capabilities to, to make my job better. And there are a number of really, really impressive capabilities that we're already pulling through into operational service. Now, I think my job in the new role will be to facilitate that and to help some of those capabilities get across the valley of death from being that, that concept demonstrator that we talked about earlier on 
to an operational capability. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with our F-35 targeted fidelity mission trainers at the moment. So that will give me some experience in that. But we've really got to nurture that talent because the reward I've got from being able to go up and see Gladiator working and know that I've had a part in delivering that, it brings a huge amount of satisfaction outside of the financial reward and and things like that. And I think that if we can enable our younger and our junior service personnel to deliver that lasting legacy, deliver something that is going to be used for years in the future, I, I think that will go a long way towards enthusing them and keeping them pushing forwards. Absolutely. I've had tingles hearing that. If I was in the RF right now and I was hearing that, it, it just gave me that confidence to keep doing what they're doing because they are yeah, doing the right thing. Uh, and that's why I'm so excited about this new role, because it, it gives a chance to develop a strategy for the Royal Air Force in terms of our use of modeling and simulation, break down some of the stovepipes that we all work within and, and allow that talent at junior levels to make its voice heard and, and to have a real effect making capabilities better making the air force more effective and you know the air force being more effective only benefits the other services you know the air force doesn't go to war for itself yeah it goes to war to enable the other services to operate and for us to reach military objectives those military objectives are only ever in support of political or strategic objectives i know all all the armed forces do it but it's that thing saying you don't just join the raf to fly you know you could join the raf to do this (laughs) You know, whether that's a cook or uh, you get into gaming technologies and that if that's a career stream, you you because we have a problem with attraction and retention. You give people something that's, that they can be passionate about, whatever that is. I, I do have a theory that the first group captain stroke colonel that grew up with a ZX-71 programming basic on an Amstrad, it might be that inflection point. I think we're almost there. <laughs> probably. So just going back to lessons learned from Gladiator, talked about COTS technologies, and, and in some ways you could say, you know, I know it's a bit tempting to say, well, well if we just use COTS technologies, that just solves all our problems. But what, what have you learned in terms of other programs going forward? I've, I've heard the term that Gladiator is the REF simulation platform. Is that a fair comment? And how do you see that lessons learned transferring, say, to land? You know, do you think they can draw from experience, copy best practice? I am certainly not going to say that Gladiator is the answer to everything. Each of the services has its own individual use case and will need a solution that works for them. What I do think is valid is that we've generated an awful lot of learning from experience over the last five years. A lot of that experience has been quite painful and it would be quite good if the other services were able to learn from that, to take insight away from that and avoid making some of those mistakes or having some of the problems we've had. So that's there, but I'm absolutely not telling other people what to do. I can give them some ideas of of maybe what not to do because we've tried it and it didn't work, but they will need to find their own solutions. With regard to the COTS piece, that's a conscious defence decision to go down the COTS route within Defence Modelling Simulation Coherence Policy, GSP 939. Has it been plain sailing? No, not at all. There are, are pros and cons to the COTS and to the the bespoke proprietary route. If you go down the bespoke proprietary route, you are working generally with large OEMs who have a lot of experience in working with the military, a lot of experience in interpreting our requirements and understanding how to deliver them. And to an extent, you pay for that expertise. If you go down the COTS route, one of the things we have found is that many of the COTS providers we use don't have that innate understanding of the military that that, that people like BA Systems or, or Tales or CAE or, or any of the other large OEMs have. So there's needed to be a lot more explaining done about how things work. And you might come up with a solution that's a really elegant engineering or coding solution for something like the GUI, the graphical user interface, that when you get the white force on it or the operators just doesn't work in the same way that their brains do. It was really important for us and DNS were really helpful in this in building up the relationship with the individual component suppliers and being able to talk directly to them and getting them involved with the white force to understand how we were going to use what they were delivering because there's there's some nuance there between the system requirements, the user requirements and how you're actually going to do it. And it's very hard to boil that this is how we're actually going to use this equipment into a coherent, articulate set of user requirements and then expect an OEM who's not really used to the military to go away and deliver that perfectly. So there was an awful lot of engagement as we went through our final 
operational testing of, of the kit. You know, there was a lot of on-site engagement with the component manufacturers to understand what we were doing and, and to make changes to it. And you know, we're already going through our first major software upgrade in line with the release of, of the various component softwares. And there's a really effective feedback loop between the Gladiator team, Boeing Defence UK, and the software OEMs where we're testing beta versions, intermediate product builds of the new software, feeding back, and that feedback is being integrated into the next version of the software. So there's a very nice beneficial feedback loop going on there. Again, that's a, I've not heard that before. It reminds me of the Johnston Burt three-legged stool of capability. It's If, if I have to paraphrase in this context, you're talking about not throwing away what the big primes have been working in military simulation for 50 years, maybe, you know, but they have a certain amount of inertia. How do you bring the, the upstarts in? How do you get them involved? Bear in mind that there was a great comment the other day from Land, a certain person in Land, who says, look, we're not going to go into a shed with VR goggles on. That's not the way we want to train. We want to get dirty and break stuff. And how do you, you know, how do you merge those environments? So it's really interesting. So it's not it's not one way or another. It's you're, you're trying to balance all of that. Yeah, absolutely. And there are some use cases where the bespoke approach is exactly right. And one of the OEMs will have a product that does exactly what you need. And that may be a time when that's your best solution. And the whole point of the MOD's procurement process is to do that concept and analysis phase that brings you the best overall fit for your solution that fits your requirements. Sometimes that is going to be a proprietary product, I think. Sometimes it's going to be down the COTS route and we're encouraged to go down the COTS route. But I think as ever, there's an old saying, isn't there, that you, you shouldn't use technology for technology's sake. So what is the most effective route to this? And, and as I, I look forward, I think my vision for Air Force modeling and simulation in the future is something along the lines of, of a suite of coherent and interoperable live, virtual, constructive and blended capabilities that enable each activity to be completed in the most effective environment. And that may well be purely live. It may be mm -hmm. that you need to get down and dirty and you need to dig a trench and you need to stand there in the pouring rain, whatever. It may be that you augment that with extended reality headsets for JTAC training or something like that to make the situation, the environment more complex. It may be that you take it entirely into a simulator. What you are trying to achieve will dictate your delivery route. So it's all about finding the right solution to your requirement. And just hearing you talk there and talk about picking the right prime versus OEM kind of solution for the problem. We hope that the procurement organizations within defense will have that expertise to know how best to advise defense. But I think it's so important, hopefully, and it sounds like the theme of the conversation here is consistency, is, is making, it's upskilling the arm, the RAF, the Air Force, the ground, you know, the army, whatever it ends up being, to understand those nuances, the expertise within different organizations, the software that's available as well, because no one knows the requirement better than the operators themselves, the users. So yes, it's great having an organization that helps us procure things, but actually the RAF really needs to be uh, swept, swept up enough to understand and be able to part of the conversation to find the right solution that suits them. It shouldn't just rely on a you know, a bit of market research done by the procurement organizations, and they should be almost led. I would suggest led by the people who actually know best, which is know the pain point, and they should have you should learn and understand the values of all the different organizations out there and the software that is available to you as well. Correct. And, and having that operating involvement really drives you towards a more agile delivery approach. And that's something that, that maybe the MOD is not as comfortable with as it might be. DNS are really good at delivering tanks, aircraft, warships that are generally done in a waterfall approach. You get a capability, you don't do much to it for five or 10 years, you deliver a midlife upgrade, you don't do much to it for five or 10 years and you retire it. With Gladiator, we took largely the same approach, but trying to make it more agile. So we went through a preliminary design review for the software. We went through a, a final design review for the software. And then the first time we really saw it and we used it in anger was when we started to do the testing. If I contrast that with one of the concept demonstrators that we've done recently, within two weeks of signing the contract, we had a desktop version of the capability working. And we were then able to agilely spiral that, bring in additional hardware, bring in additional software to, to make it work. Now, I think certainly for modeling and simulation and IT-based capabilities, that agile approach is really necessary. And there's one specific reason for that is that requirements change and also the available technology, technological solutions change. 
as you go through. I said that Gladiator's taken about five years to get from contract to initial operating capability. Some of our requirements have moved on in that time frame. There are some things we don't need to do anymore. There are some things that we found a better way to do, and there are some new things that we need to do. And the ways that we, the capabilities that we can use to deliver those requirements have also changed. So you need an agile delivery framework and you need that ability to talk to your delivery agent and your supplier to go, okay, we know this is what we asked you to do. Actually, this is what we need to do. This will make your life easier. We don't need you to do this anymore, but can you do this instead? And that I think is a bit of a mindset change. And it's difficult commercially because it brings in a lot more uncertainty, I think, both for the MOD and for the supplier. You're starting to answer my next question, which is, what does the future of air training look like? But it sounds like that's something that's much more, to use your term, agile, much more responsive, something that's not a fixed training device that's going to train the same thing for 20 years. Yeah, so I come back to that nascent vehicle of mine, that, that suite of coherent, interoperable capabilities that mean you can do each bit of training in the most effective environment. Now, some of that's going to be live, and then there's some stuff you're always going to need to do in the live environment. I think what you do in the live environment will change over the next five to 10 years, but you know maybe we'll come on to that later on. Then you've got your individual force element simulators. So let's take TFST, the Typhoon Future Synthetic Trainer that BAE Systems are just delivering. That is a, a really swept up full mission simulator that can train pilots to operate the aircraft safely. So it does all of that air safety work that training the pilots to fly but also training the top to operate and tfst will operate in standalone mode and that can operate you know at above secret and then will also operate linked into gladiator across a secure bearer network and as part of that defense approach to synthetic procurement tfst shares an awful lot of components and software with gladiator you know, they are inextricably linked. It has components where it has diverged for the time being because they have a specific requirement that Gladiator cannot map, for instance, in the image generator. If you're going to do close-in air manoeuvring, then you need a slightly better image generator than Gladiator needs for a white force out the window view. So you'll have those full mission simulators that can operate in standalone mode and potentially link to Gladiator. I think you'll also have targeted fidelity mission trainers that enable you to focus on the operational parts of an aircraft's role or a capabilities role. The reason for that is full mission simulators are really expensive because they're a very complex piece of kit. They have to do an awful lot. And frankly, the Air Force probably can't afford the number that we would need to meet those 50-50 and upwards live synthetic balances that we're being driven towards. So we need to fill that gap with something that isn't as good as a full mission simulator, but does part of that job. And that's what we're looking at, certainly with Lightning at the moment, where we have a number of very capable but expensive full mission simulators, but probably not as many as we need. And we are delivering a set of targeted fidelity mission trainers that will take some of the load off those full mission simulators, enable the Lightning Force to train at the mass they need to train at, and to do that package integration training that Gladiator can provide. There's still a gap there, and that's for that fourth, fifth gen high level training and for that you need a a standalone system that can operate at program level you know high classifications possibly again with targeted fidelity mission trainers in it and that's where you can get your typhoon pilots your your lightning pilots your wedge tail operators tempest in due course together to do that high end tactical training work develop tactics develop capabilities moving almost into the T and E space, but certainly that tactics development space, so that they know how they're going to operate on day one, night one of an operation. And that's the sort of stuff that you can't do in the live environment for security reasons, due to a lack of the airspace that you need to be able to operate to your full potential, and due to safety reasons as well. If you're going to try out new tactics and, and new maneuvers and new capabilities, Sometimes they're not going to work. So you want to develop those in a safe environment where you're not going to potentially throw 50, 60 million pounds worth of aircraft away when something goes wrong. And then the final bit, I think, is that LVC, that blended mix where you link the virtual and constructive and live environments together and understanding, you know, when we would do that, why we would do that and what benefit that brings. So I think there's the huge piece for air training to move forward to, and that's before we've even looked at headquarters training. So how do you train your air component headquarters? 
how do you do your wargaming? How do you do those other bits and pieces? We'll come back to that just at the end. There's so much to cover. But just briefly, we were going on, and you mentioned it, that actually what I love about where simulation is going is we haven't got to the end. We've sort of got so far and go, mm-hmm. oh, wow, now we're opening up a whole area that we hadn't realized was possible. And I'm sort of using this term as experimental. So, you know, when you and I were in the box, that's the right way. There's the procedure, you follow the procedure, the checks, the emergencies. There was really only one, maybe two ways to get it right. Now, actually, this environment is about, well, have we thought of this? It's about problem solving. It's really fascinating where that can go. Absolutely. And one of the things we're doing with Gladiator at the moment, because we're at a stage where we are trying to integrate the platforms and capabilities, and that's quite a slow process. And sometimes we're waiting for other people to do bits before we can move on to the next piece. So we're taking that time to investigate whatever gladiator can do so we put together this system based against a set of user requirements and system requirements now we're looking at what else we can use that system for what else can it do so we've already demonstrated a link to the live environment and the ability to move data link pictures and data to and from the live environment we're looking at how we can use the gladiator synthetic environment for T and E for R and D and DSTL are actually putting together a, a gladiator instantiation at the moment in their digital sandbox. We've got one down at the Rapid Capabilities Office in Project Eldon. So as you say, looking to that, what can we do with this? What more can we do? And and how do we try new things? Gladiator is not going to be able to do all of that because that's all about the fidelity of the synthetic environment, the EW environment, the fidelity of your platform modeling, your environmentals and things like that. So Gladys is absolutely not the answer or the full answer where it is now, but it does provide that start point for development. And we're already seeing it developing pretty quickly as we try to bring in capabilities that we know Typhoon will need at its capability upgrades that we know Wedgetail will need as we come through. And the benefit of taking an enterprise level approach within Gladiator is that Gladiator does that development work and the other platforms benefit from it instead of us paying for it three times and, and everybody trying to do it themselves. Yeah, and, and it's fascinating that we see some of this. You know, none of these are particularly new ideas, but now it's sort of within grasp. And that's what's fantastic, whereas 10 years ago is like, well, we have to build it. Now, what are the challenges of putting SIM into live? Now, we got good examples, I guess, with things like the Scopic project in land, where they put synthetics into the live environment. Is it a similar problem or have you got a whole different problem set that's vastly more challenging for that? I think the first question with with that whole blended thing is understanding the why. What are you trying to achieve? There are some areas where we've done blended for a long time. Sped Adam is blended to trade. You know, we're using synthetic threats into aircraft radars, etc. The IRAT. Sorry, just just to, I'll do a Tom, (laughs) just to clarify. That's like a seek ahead that's trying to stimulate our defensive aids or something like that is that what you're talking about or sped adam uses real emulated or or simulated surface to air missile threats and radars to provide train for aircraft flying over overhead you've also got the medium speed air support contract and the interim red air contracts that another part of air cap is delivering that provide that lvc blend but I'm not sure that we understand how ubiquitous LVC is going to be. If we take the fact that you have significant security constraints with operating in in the live environment, you have significant airspace constraints, certainly within the UK and Europe, in being able to treat the airspace in peacetime as you would in wartime, and then you've got the air safety constraints. So to take that augmented reality use case that you were talking about, Colin, in Scopic, If you start putting an SU-35 into the head-up display, into the visor of a Typhoon pilot or a Lightning pilot, and they start getting into manoeuvring with it, at what stage does that become a distraction from flying the aircraft safely and from operating it? I don't know, and and it's certainly not an area of, of expertise for me. I'm just highlighting the areas that we'll have to work through as we bring in those LVC capabilities. And certainly, once you start to break into the operating systems of the aircraft to host these capabilities, then you do start to affect the safety case of the aircraft. So there are some aircraft, the Hawk T2, I think the F-35, the T7, that have these capabilities built in organically. And I think that's the ideal area for those. But I really don't know how ubiquitous that LVC is 
capability is going to be within air. And I do know that if we do do it, it'll be very complex and therefore it'll take a long time to deliver and be pretty expensive. So it comes back to whether the juice is worth the squeeze to use an, an Americanism. I was just about to use exactly the same term because, you know, <laughs> one of the things on the ground side is go back to augmented reality. There's augmented reality for some things, but the true holy grail of fighting hand-to-hand combat with a virtual soldier, that's probably never going to happen and not worth it. So when you see some technology which is like, this is a totally haptic suit that gives you feedback, and it's like, yeah, we could do that, but for the training we're going to get, that's probably not what we're going to do. I think one of the keys will be as we move forward is understanding, you know, there are so many converging capabilities at the moment. Understanding where we can use those, where it's useful to use those and where it's not useful to use those. Because sometimes a low-tech solution is going to be the best solution. That's a good point to to end. Tom, any other thoughts on all that? No, I loved it. Um, I'm really excited. I think the future of synthetics is in good hands with the RAF, Rory, with you. I, I can't wait. I'd love an opportunity to come and see it in action at one time. Yeah, because again, I, I like extrapolating these uh, distributed training out to like the reserves, obviously, because that's where I kind of ended my career and, and the value I know it will bring to reserves. And up yeah. until now, it, the challenge has been based on basically secure distributed platforms, like how, just how does it really work in drill halls and reserve units? But I, I hope that is a direction it goes for all those reservists out there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Reservists, you know, we're talking to the air cadets about how we can help them and yeah. lot, lots of other areas. So I think it's a it's a massively expanding area and it's it's really exciting for me. And I'm I'm glad to be able to have another bite of this cherry. Thank you for um spending that hour with us. That's excellent. Thank you, Rory. Now am I right in thinking that the RAF are the first British military arm to create a full time simulation senior leadership role? Well, I don't know, but I think what we can say is having a chief modelling and simulation officer means they're taking it seriously, which is good news. Definitely. I think there's been various roles that have tried to pull all this together, but I think there's a recognition they need to sort of get some continuity. That's what I've seen in Gladiator, dare I say, is there are people that provide that continuity through the programme, which helps them as well as people that understand what they're doing. Do you think it was a tactical decision to pull that role into a reserve slot that allows that extended continuity because there isn't that constant drive for for your career? You need to change your role every two to whatever years insert time period here. Do they did that on purpose or is it just I don't know, the way the opportunities have fallen? Yeah, again, you're asking me questions outside of my, my expertise, but no, it, it does sound good if you are FTRS post Sorry, for our outside of the UK military, that's a full-time reserve post. That means you're not going to be getting moved around. That post is there and you've got best of both worlds, someone that understands the subject matter as well as someone that has the sort of deep military knowledge. Yeah, I don't think we went into it in enough detail at the time. Again, probably because of the time constraint, but I'm if we could get up there and see it in action, the things that I want to see, just from a person who has, of course, been to military camps, installed and delivered military training using simulation and synthetics it is hard work it's a nightmare things fall over laptops break laptops crash connections fall over so the idea of tens of people inside this complex distributed simulation training environment to do some complex maneuvers and to get training value out the other end like i just want to see it in action to see how smooth they've managed to get it some of the challenges they might face and then understand kind of how they want to go forward in order to streamline it even more Yeah, I mean, it's something which I've observed. These things are relatively easy to do at a sort of demonstration level. Remember, Gladiator is son of Desalt and the other programs that went before it. So the concept's nothing new, but the implementation becomes bigger and more complicated and Mm -hmm. sort of exponentially gets harder, I think. And so from the outside, you say, well, that should be straightforward. But actually, there's loads of moving parts. You're effectively got a... A, a, a play right there's loads of actors involved and then you've got it <laughs> put all those together there's many more things that can go wrong and if any one of those things don't work i remember we didn't run a very large exercise but if the comms failed yeah that's it no Done. you can't do anything so it doesn't matter how small the failure is yeah it, it can stop your training so and i do hope that the other arms and services have their listening ears on, as I'll say to my four-year-old <laughs> and and Rory. And I, you know, I liked how kind of humble Rory is in terms of his approach. Saying, "Look, you know, our solution isn't isn't going to be the right solution for the other arms and services." However, we have learned a lot, so please do listen. Although I did hear a quote, was it about 
don't know which service it was, but it, it's they will they will do the opposite of whatever the other services do just to yeah. j- just because. <laughs> and yeah, yes, 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 maybe we're beyond that these days. You'd like to think. <laughs> I mean, you can treat it like a kit of parts or a tool set. You can borrow the bits you like and ditch the bits you don't. That's the beauty of it. But the key is learning about what the real challenges are. As I said, you know, if you build a demo, a proof of concept, that's always relatively easy. But some of the harder things you never anticipate. And that's what I think, you know, when we go to the shows and we see the, some of the snazzy technology, but implementing that in a full scale program with some of the limitations that are imposed because it's a big program and security layers and all that sort of stuff yeah right well hopefully our listeners really enjoyed that i definitely enjoyed it and actually weirdly i enjoyed editing it as well so <laughs> for a change <laughs> yeah another thing to mention only because it's coming around again is iitsec which is a well, world's biggest defense training and simulation conference at orlando florida towards the end of november which this the who's who when it comes to training and simulation in this space i mean colin you are you going to be there this year yeah very much on our calendar i'll be going around with a notepad trying to count the number of people who've got some sort of i don't know ai on their stand <laughs> this was replacing vr if you've not it, read it is no i like that i do like how it is placed you know entering into winter for the uk and you get and get spent 10 days out in orlando florida it is a you know what you're saying that's got nothing to do with it <laughs> <laughs> All right, mate. Well, uh, uh, anyone wants to find out more, you can find us on LinkedIn, uh, Warfighter Podcast there, and you won't ever miss an episode if you follow our newsletter. See you on the next episode, Colin. Thanks. See you then.